Good evening, everyone, and welcome to, uh, yes, this is the Angelic Conflict class. Today, being the beginning of the month, we are switching the routine a little bit so as to have a little bit of a variety. And so uh, we are going to start with the Angelic Conflict class on today, which is a Tuesday night. And uh, we will have the Romans class on the Thursday night. For those of you who are just joining us, uh, this uh, is a scheduling change. If it causes too much confusion, please let me know and we will revert back to the Tuesday Romans, Thursday Angelic Conflict class. For now, I would invite you to join us in this particular study. And in order for us to begin, we always begin, as is our now our tradition, with a few moments of silent prayer. The time of silent prayer is utilized so that we can confess our sins and prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word. And uh, in so doing, then we uh, can gain the maximum benefit from these lessons. We get the maximum benefit because the Holy Spirit then is free to teach us everything that uh, He wants us to learn from the particular lesson. If you are new to this type of a tradition, then let me tell you that 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful, and that means that he will do this every time, and just to forgive us our sins, and that means that he will do it and do it righteously. And so he will also cleanse us from all unrighteousness or wrongdoing. This then frees the Holy Spirit, according to John 14, 26, to do his work as a comforter and as his teacher to teach us all that is in the mind of Christ. So having said that, let's take a few moments for silent prayer, and then I will close with audible prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this opportunity that we have to open your word and to be not only refreshed and animated, but Father, to be propelled into higher heights, the heights of Christian growth and maturity. We thank you that you have given us this capability, despite the fact that we are not Face to face, we recognize that your word is not bound. We ask, uh, Father, that you would promote us in this ministry. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, for those of you who has just joined us, this is Tuesday night, and instead of having a Romans class, we're going to have an angelic conflict class tonight. And we, on Thursday, will switch over to Romans class. If uh, this causes too much confusion in your mind or in the mind of those that you have invited in the past, then we can revert back to the old schedule. So let us continue then with this particular session on the angelic conflict. We always begin the angelic conflict by reciting a couple of verses that we find in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. Remember that this is the Lord Jesus Christ who is announcing to Satan the victory that will take place. It is the ultimate victory. And we are not only talking about the strategic victory, but also the tactical victory in the angelic conflict. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you 
shall bruise him on the heel. Genesis chapter 3, verses 13, or verses 14 and 15. Okay, this is capital letter F, victory on the angelic front. Our first sub point, or point number one, is the cross, which is the strategic victory in the angelic conflict. This is that victory which is so principal, it is so main that it breaks the back of Satan. It fixes it so that he is not able to refute. He is beyond any argument of refutation and as a result the victory is complete and it is gained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Five incremental parts to this strategic victory. The first of them is the hypostatic union of the Lord Jesus Christ, followed by his crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, and then fifthly, the attribution of the third royal warrant, which is another way of referring to Operation Footstool. Operation Footstool brings us into contact with Isaiah 53 and verse 12, where you can see that I have listed, and I will point them out with my cursor, you can see that I have listed four parts. The first is an introduction to the book of Isaiah. Then after that, we see that the triumph of Christ is certain, verse 12. The triumph of Christ is costly, verse 12. The triumph of Christ is complete, verse 12. And now, after finishing those, we have gone to an apostille on the royal family of God. We are now introduced to those who are followers of Christ in the dispensation of the church. These are the ones who will receive the booty that is won by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I might add, not the only ones who will receive the booty, but the ones who receive the lion's share. So this brings us to number five, apostille, royal family of God. The royal family of God. And let me give you a quick rundown. Letter A, the most obvious feature of the, of the royal family of God is seen in three facets. We studied those for a while. The basis of the royal family of God is letter B, letter C, a descriptive description of the royal family of God. Letter D, the portraits of the royal family. These are found in the books of Ephesians, Hebrews, Romans, and Colossians. Letter E, the escutcheon of the royal family. This is like that uh, shield that appears in the uh, code uh, or the uh, uh, the colors of a family, uh, the coat of arms. And uh, in the case of you and me, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, you and I cannot see the indwelling. You and I cannot smell it, hear it, or feel it. It is not perceptible by the human uh, senses of investigation. However, the angelic world can see it. They can look at us and they can see that we are wearing the emblem of the royal family of God. And that emblem is the residence of the Holy Spirit. The residence of the Holy Spirit then prepares a temple in which the God the Father and God the Son also take up residence unprecedented in any time in human history that all three members of the Trinity will live in a human being. So we have A, B, C, D, and E, and now we come to letter F, a chronological sequence of the royal family. And uh, to cut matters a little short, let me just jump to point number five under this chronological sequence. And point number five, I'll leave this with you, is the concluding thought to the royal family of God. As the God-man, that is the Lord Jesus Christ in hypostatic union, he is a new type of royalty. 
superior royalty, permanent royalty, spiritual royalty. Thus, he must have a royal family to share his reign. And that is where you come in. So that finishes our study in the area of the royal family of God. And so let's go back to our outline so that we can orient and uh, see where we have been and where we are going. F, victory on the angelic front. First point under F, the cross, which is the strategic victory in the angelic conflict that was won by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is mentioned in Genesis chapter 3 and verse uh, 15, where we have the crushing of Satan's head. There are five incremental portions to this strategic victory. There's the hypostatic union, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, and we have just finished with Operation Footstool, or the attribution of the third royal warrant. Now we come to number two, the second point under F, victory on the angelic front, and this is the tactical victory, and this is the existence and function of the church. The existence and function of the church, number two, followed or following the cross, which would be number one. We are going to look at this particular study, number two, under three captions. The first of them is a working definition of a tactical victory. The definition of a tactical victory is a little bit more complicated than I want to go into in a couple of sentences. And uh, you can do research on your own and get that information. Hopefully I will give you enough information to give you a pictorial idea of what a tactical victory is. The second item will be the briefing to the operation. That is, Operation Church must be briefed. And we have an instructor that gives us that briefing. That briefing is the Holy Spirit who uses the communicator of his word to brief his people, which is the Church of Jesus Christ. Operation Briefing. This, by far, will be the greatest or the biggest, the largest segment of our study under number two. We will go to other studies as we move on, but Operation Briefing will be the largest of those particular um, increments. Let us see. A hortatory encouragement. And this is how we will close this particular segment with the encouragement that is given by God as far as this subject matter is concerned. There are many uh, encouragement statements that are given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, which are phenomenal and should actually thrill your soul. So let's begin then with the working Definition of a tactical victory. What is a tactical victory? Working definition of tactical victory. First sub point. In World War II, the Japanese naval forces had been defeated, thus signaling a United States victory in the war. But there were many strongholds in the Pacific Islands where Japanese troops controlled the land and the people. Although their defeat was obvious, their stubborn loyalty to the emperor and their resolute resolve to fight to the death kept the war alive for a long time. For the world to come to peace, U.S. troops had to go from island to island in a mop-up operation to dislodge the obstinate Japanese troops from airstrips, forts, and caves. Below, you're able to see uh, the uh, plan of attack by Admiral uh, Chester Nimitz. 
and how he went from island to island to island to island. You will uh, take note of the Japanese rising sun flag in the Pacific Ocean, and you will see the pink items that uh, my cursor is showing. You had them here in Southeast Asia and in the Malaysian islands, and um, as well as uh, in China, the northern uh, eastern part of China and Russia, where Japan had invaded and had taken under its control all of these lands. It was Admiral Nimitz's idea to clear them out little by little because they were very stubborn soldiers. And he began with the islands and he started moving upward until we came to the final steps in the war to avoid further loss of U.S. troops because that mop-up operation was very costly in U.S. lives. Fat Man and Little Boy were unleashed and brought the war to an abrupt end. Fat Boy, or Fat Man and Little Boy brought the war to an abrupt end. What is Fat Man and Little Boy? They are two atomic bombs. An atomic bomb, as you can see in the left-hand lower part of your screen, is a bomb which is so devastating, it is so hot, that in seconds, first you get the shock wave from the explosion, which immediately blows almost everything away for miles. Secondly, just seconds later, you have a wave of heat where the temperature is in excess of a thousand degrees, which means that instantaneously, what that wave of heat touches, it evaporates immediately. Then, of course, that is followed by the particular or particulate fallout that comes from the mushroom cloud that falls upon the land. This is additional radiation which causes a horrendous amount of death. Now, the reason that the U.S. decided to drop these two bombs was so that the tactical victory would be shortened and the strategic victory would be enhanced and be made final. The finalization was then done on one of our American ships and you can see our American sailors, the uh, naval staff at standing at attention and on the other picture you can see the Japanese delegation coming dressed in their finery and in their military regalia to sign the treaty. The Flying Heritage and Combat Armor Museum at Payne Field. As you can see, there are some uh, notorious individuals in front of this particular airplane. And uh, we went to visit this museum, which incidentally is just in Mukilteo. It is barely a 15 minute drive from Everett. And uh, I'm not going to mention the names because you already knew who is there. And uh, but I want you to know that it was a very instructive visit. And uh, we wish that we would have been able to stay longer to see all of that uh, war material that is now in a museum state. On the left, you have the bomb called Little Boy. On the right, you have the bomb called Fat Man. Fat Man was dropped first. Little Boy was dropped second. Little Boy was approximately 15 times the capacity, the destroying the capacity of Fat Man. 
It is the dropping of these two bombs dr dropped approximately in a three-day period that brought the war to an end. That is what finally brought the tactical victory into prominence so that the strategic victory could be recognized. By the way, you can go to Payne Field any day and visit and take a look at these two replicas. These are the most horrible instruments of war that you and I could ever envision. And if Everett were ever bombed with an atomic bomb, we would be evaporated from Everett all the way down to Portland, and there would be nothing left, not even charred remains. Operation Briefing. A briefing to the operation that we call the Church Age. And so let me begin first and foremost with Operation Briefing. And I would like to have you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. The sixth chapter of Ephesians, please. We will introduce ourselves to the verse at hand, which is verse 12. And if you have turned there, I have quoted verse 12 here. So let me read the quote. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against powers and against the forces, world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Well, this is definitely... Uh, part of the curriculum for the briefing. But the briefing actually begins in verse 10. And so if you will turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. And let's see what it says. Would you please turn with me there? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We will come back to this passage later, but I want you to notice that there are three words that are used here to convey strength and might. There is be strong, that's the first one, in the strength, that's the second word, strength, and of his might, that's the third word. Three different words in Greek. They tell us about the amazing power that has been deposited into us by baptism of the Holy Spirit so that we can be eligible troops in the angelic conflict. And as such, we can participate in the tactical victory of the angelic conflict. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And in verse 11, you will notice that you have a command like would be given in any military camp. Armor up or suit up so that you will be able to stand firm. And take a note of this word, standing firm, because this does not mean to go out in a foray to attack. It means to hold your ground. It means to hold your ground. So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Take note of the word schemes here because it is talking about plans, machinations. It is not talking about direct attacks. What is a direct attack? Well, let's say, for instance, that you are sitting in a restaurant and the devil comes up and cuts your head off with a sharp knife. Of course, he's not going to do that because that's not what he does. 
he has schemes to make you fall in the angelic conflict. And why is that? And that's because the angelic conflict is not a struggle where we have a hand-to-hand, -hand, mano a mano combat, where we are fighting physically with angelic creatures. First and foremost, they are way more powerful than we are. We don't stand a chance. However, by putting on the full armor of God, we are able to withstand whatever plan, whatever trick he has for us. Verse 12. Now we come to our verse. For, and I'll begin by saying that the word for means because. Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it is against the rulers, against the powers, against the world's forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you would be able to resist in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, please take a look at verse 13 here. We have the repetition of the phrase, standing firm, to stand firm. Verse 14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, not just for your favorites, but for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, let us return to verse 12, and let us notice once again what it says. It begins, first of all, by saying that our struggle the word in Greek is he pale. And uh, I know I just put up a uh, white box at the top of your screen, and I am making the words he pale uh, kind of wave at you. And that is because this is the word for struggle. Now, the word for struggle is an interesting word because in English it could mean any number of things. But in Greek, it had a specific meaning, and that particular meaning was an old word that in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you were to throw or to swing. And in this particular case, this is the only time that this word is used in, in the New Testament. So this is a special word. And so this word means to throw or to swing. It is a contest between two until one hurls the other down and holds him down. And uh, you can see on the uh, left lower corner of your screen a WWE match where somebody is sitting on top of somebody else holding him down to the mat. This is what this word struggle means. It doesn't just mean a wrestling match. It means a fight. A fight until one person or one of the combatants 
completely gives up. All right. Also take note of the time that the word pros, that's P-R-O-S, is used five times and it is translated against. And this is a face-to-face -face conflict to the finish. So if you follow my cursor, you can count them. Pros, one, two, three, four, and number five. It is translated against. Our struggle is not against, number one, but against the rulers, number two, against the world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. You don't see it so much in the English, but you do see it and you can see it in the Greek. Why is this important? Because this tells us that this is not an easy fight. This is a fight against one opponent followed by another, maybe two of them ganging up on you as in uh, tag team wrestling. This is a fight where somebody needs to be defeated and the defeated person has his face or his head to the mat. That is what this particular struggle is. And so we are told that our struggle or our wrestling match, if you want to use that diluted term, our struggle, our fight is not against flesh and blood. So we have seen the word struggle, hey pale, and then we see is not. And the word is not, and let me follow my cursor up here, our struggle is not, and I'm circling the words, is not. This is the Greek construction, uk estin. Uk estin. And there are a lot of things that I could say about this, but let me just say that it just means that it does not exist. It is not so. So our struggle does not exist or is not, is not constituted by a struggle against blood and flesh. This tells us that our opponent is not human. I know that there are shows on TV, The Walking Dead, the zombie type shows. And uh, what they attempt to demonstrate is that you can shoot them, you can stab them. But because they are already dead, then you can't really defeat them. You must completely destroy them. Well, somewhat the same in the angelic conflict, except that you are powerless to destroy them. You have no weapons to destroy them. All that you can do is to resist them. And the armor that is given to us here in Ephesians chapter 6 is all defensive in its approach. So it begins by saying that it is not against blood and flesh. Now we usually say flesh and blood, but in the Greek it has it reversed. Not human. These opponents of ours are not human, and so they do not fall prey to human instruments of war. Number two, but against. We come in contact with the con, uh, conjunction of contrast Allah plus the preposition pros, which means face to face. So our wrestling or our struggle is not against humans but it is a hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face combat with rulers. And what are rulers? Well, rulers in this passage are principalities. And if you have the King James Bible, you will have this word principalities. And what the word means, and we will come back to this, so don't fear that we are rushing over the top of it. 
What this word means is that these are angelic folks. I guess you call them folks. That exercise the privileges of noble birth. We have very little knowledge and understanding of the angelic universe. We don't know much about how they traffic or how they transit from one place to another, what it is that they have to do to survive from one day to the next, if anything. <sighs> what we do know is that there are different categories of angelic creation and a good way of saying this is that there are different ranks that there are echelons in the angelic community uh, probably a little more colorful and a little easier for us to uh, imagine or to visualize is to call them races angelic races and these particular races, uh, the rulers, these are of the upper crest. In the angelic society, these are principalities. They are princes. They rule over others. They have privileges of rulership, privileges of being in noble birth. The second item that we have in our verse is that we also are doing hand-to-hand -hand combat, mano-a-mano, face-to-face combat with powers. Now, as you look at verse 12 and as you analyze it, you will find that rulers and powers are fairly stripped of any descriptive phrases. Once again, let me emphasize, we do not know what the angelic universe is like. We are just given these titles for them. And just like rulers are principalities which exercise privileges of noble birth, these powers are creatures having extreme authorities. And what this means is that their authority is more than we can imagine. And I don't even want to speculate as to how their authority might be exercised. But we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can corral these, who can herd these, and make them mind. The next item, world forces, world forces of this darkness, world forces of this darkness. And just like we have in powers, that is letter B, creatures of extreme authorities, apparently there are those who are under that authority and these are powers or forces of this darkness. In other words, whatever the powers say, these angelic creatures are forces that execute those commands, and that is executed in a world of darkness. They are world forces. Now, if you look on your Bible, you will see that that is precisely what it says world forces of this darkness. Then comes a comma, and then we have the last phrase, and it says spiritual forces of wickedness. But if you look at the word forces, you will find that it is in italics. And really what it means is this. Spiritual things of wickedness. These are spiritual creatures of icky wickedness. They are obsessed with creating wickedness. They would be obsessed 
in encircling you with wickedness so that you would fall. Were it not for the fact that the Lord has proclaimed a wall of fire that is surrounds you so that you cannot be touched unless you use your personal volition to fall into doctrines of demons. Because remember, these are filthy spiritual forces. And forces isn't the right word. Spiritual things. Spiritual things of wickedness. And they are in heavenly places, which means they are still there, not having been kicked out yet. So, how do we fight them? How can you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and in this dispensation, how can we fight these? We are presented with an enemy that we cannot see, an enemy that we cannot hear, an enemy that is completely imperceptible by human senses, just like the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not perceptible by your senses, Neither are these. I know there are countless stories of people that have seen a candlestick move. They have seen a move or a book move across the room. They have seen somebody sitting at the table. And by using his mentalist talents, put out the candle without blowing on it. And without touching it. How is this done? Well, these are angelic beings. And these angelic beings have rebelled against God. And they disobey every law that God has put down. Just like you disobey the speeding laws when you get on the freeway. So long as you don't get caught, it's okay. They do the same thing. They will violate some of the laws of physics. And so long as they don't get caught, they are okay. So how do we fight these? How do we fight these individuals, these angelic creatures? Well, the scripture tells us, first of all, to take up the full armor of God. First of all, I want to call your attention that in verse 12, it says that we must take up, or in verse 13, it says that we must take up the full armor of God. Verse 13. We conclude that this armor is not an armor that we have put together. For example, you cannot fashion a necklace that you put around your neck that will keep the evil spirits away. You will not be able to drink a special potion that will keep the evil spirits away. You will not be able to, to pinch some dust that has been mixed with ground bones or ground hair or ground something taken from a goat or from some other animal and put it on your head or smear it on your body that will protect you and keep the evil spirits away. The only effective defensive measure that you can take is the armor that God provides. Let me repeat, the armor that God provides, if you use something else, you are going to fail. You are going to be an injury, a fatality in the angelic conflict. Next, I want to call your attention that it says the full armor of God or the whole armor. And that is, don't get into such a hurry that you just put on one of the pieces and you go off to battle. Why is that? 
Well, because teenagers do that. Spiritual adolescents do that. They think that they're ready. Boy, they'll slam the door behind them because they are going out to fight the devil. And you know what? They find themselves someplace where they are not, they're not even marching uh, in time. They're not marking time. They're just out of the battle. They could be used, but they're not because they're on the sidelines. They're in the penalty box. They're sitting there and they don't even know the rules of the game. Take up the full armor of God. So now you're going to ask me, how do I know what the full armor is and how do I know that I got it on? Well, that is why we are going to have to go through this passage in more detail. Next, it goes on to say in verse 13, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. Please take note of the word resist. It is the Greek word anti histomy or anti uh, histomy from theomai and what this means it means to stand against but it doesn't mean to fight it means a good word is resist it means that they will push on you and you will just take it they will push on you but you won't give ground you will just stay there and resist 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 why? Because angels have not been given permission to push you and to kill you. The permission that has been given to them by God is limited indeed. And you can stand firm. And listen, this passage, verse 13, says resist in the evil day. And that is because in all the days of your life, there will come one day when you will be attacked more than any other time in your whole life. The question is, will you be ready? Will you have the whole armor of God? Or did you waste time, instead of going to Bible class, not learning about the armor, and so you waste the time, the attack comes, and you are unprepared. Resist in the evil day. Let me tell you about this word resist. There are two passages of scripture that I want to call your attention at this time. Would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts? And we will first go to Acts chapter 6. And you probably will remember. You probably will remember when Mark read from chapter 6. How there was an individual by the name of Stephen. And as uh, you are turning there, let me, be, let me begin to read at verse 8 of Acts chapter, Acts chapter 6. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men, from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. The word for argue here means that they had a verbal challenge, a verbal argument. Verse 10, And they were unable to resist with wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. In other words, Please take note of the fact that the battle, the angelic battle here was won with wisdom, that is Bible doctrine resident in your soul, and with the in, uh, filling of the Holy Spirit. You have to be full with the Holy Spirit before you can do this. So this is the first way in which we see this word resist come up. Would you now go to number... 13, please. Chapter 13. And we will look at verse 8. And as uh, we uh, get to verse 8, let me begin to read at verse, verse 6. 
When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus. A man of intelligence, this man summoned Bar-Jesus, or Barnabas, and Saul, and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them. Now see this word opposing? This means that he was objecting to them, that he was resisting them. And because the uh, proconsul had him as a consultant, he would say, don't listen to Barnabas and Saul. Don't listen to them. And he would find any excuse to object or to put himself in the way so that this proconsul would not hear the gospel. This is, look at it very careful, this is angelic conflict. It is not fought with a sword. It is not fought with contact weapons or firearms or things of that nature. All right, let me have you go to another passage of scripture now. Would you now turn to James chapter 4, please? James chapter 4. And I want to read verse 7, but I need to begin at verse 6. This is one of my favorite verses, as I'm sure it is one of yours. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves, therefore. What's the therefore? Because of the grace that's involved. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Please take note that the word resist is being used here because this is the essence of spiritual warfare. How do you resist the devil? Look at Acts 6.10 and look at Acts, 6, uh, at, at Acts 13.8. That is the reason that we went to those verses. So verse... <coughs> Verse 7, once again, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In other words, battle is over. End of story, you have won. Next passage, would you turn 1 Peter 5, 9. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, and really I want to read verses 8 and 9, but I want to call your attention to verse 5 before you begin. You younger men, likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for, or because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And now, verses 8 and 9, be sober, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Verse 8 sets the stage that we are involved in a combat. And this combat actually is similar to the combat that took place in the Colosseum. And there's a lion that is circling around you and other Christians, and he is looking for the low-hanging fruit. Verse 9, but resist him. Here is our verb again. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Let me stop there for a second. One of the tricks 
that Satan uses is that when you are suffering, he makes you go to your own pity party. Oh, poor me. I am suffering so much. Nobody suffers like I do. I am the number one primo sufferer in the plan of God. But look at this verse. It says, verse 9, Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You may not know them, but they're, they are believers in Christ just like you, and they are suffering just like you. And so by resisting that temptation to go into that pity party, you will win the conflict, that hand-to-hand, -hand, you see. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Stories over, you have won. One last item before we sign off for tonight. Stand firm. This is the doctrine of Staco, and I've given this to you in the past. We will go through it again in the future. And then there is an addenda. That is more than one addendum, and it begins in verse 18 of Ephesians 6. And they all have to do with prayer. Pray for yourself, pray for your fellow believers, and pray for the communicator of Bible doctrine so that he is able to speak with the boldness that he is supposed to speak with. And so I close by laying this request at your feet. Pray for me that I will be given the boldness, the confidence, the assurance, the strength, the courage to speak God's word as I ought to speak it. And with that, we close for this evening. Good night to you all.